everyone. In this talk, we will present our paper, Robotic Improvises, Rule-Based Improvisation and Emergent Behavior in HRI, written by Irena Kobilla Trouten and Maike Blaker from Utrecht University and Kim Barak and Kim Hendricks from the Free University of Amsterdam. Our paper is about how improvisational techniques from the performing arts can be used to address a key challenge in HRI, namely to create and sustain engaging social interactions. In our case study, we explored this in an open-ended playful scenario, but we see a possibility of this framework being embedded in other HRI applications, such as educational or therapeutical ones. This investigation is part of the project Acting Like a Robot, in which we investigate how expertise from the theatre can be used for the development of robot behaviour and HRI. Improvisation has already been used in social robotics, but usually with a goal-oriented approach in mind and with an internal perspective. That is, most projects understand improvisation and, as based on the existence and later on expressions of internal states, and their goal is to correctly express such states. Furthermore, most of these projects are also based on human models of doing things. But we propose a different approach. Firstly, we're interested in exploring rule-based improvisation methods, a type of improvisation that has existed since at least the second half of the 20th century and where choices are made in the moment and according to sets of rules. The rules of this type of improvisation offer a more emergent approach rather than goal-oriented, as they provide a set of possibilities for movement to emerge in response to an input and also an external approach rather than internal in as much as set rules do not rely on a mandatory expressive component, which has to do with internal states of the improviser. The external and imagined approaches combined are the least explored in social robotics at the moment, but as we propose in our paper, they are the most interesting to further develop. The rules that are part of rule-based improvisational methods bear resemblance to rules of play, because they do not necessarily deal with the communication of a message, but focus instead on how to be responsive and maintain engagement. For example, the rules in the game Twister, such as right foot to red, afford movement possibilities, thus creating an engaging interaction where unexpected movement patterns can emerge from simple rules, and this having nothing to do with communicational content. In our paper, we show how this approach can be beneficial to HRI in several ways. Firstly, it foregrounds playfulness, an essential part of social interaction that is usually under address and that can enhance engagement. Secondly, it deals with how the rules of HRI can be flexible and creative while not dealing with symbolic or conventional communication. And finally, this approach also exposes a different role of movement in communication, one that does not depend on expressing intention or a particular message, but the rather focuses on responsiveness and on sustaining interaction. We develop a workshop with professional dancers to explore the external and imagined approach to improvisation and use William Forsyth improvisational technologies to do so. We first analyzed the 43 tools that he proposes for improvisation, divided them in different categories and explored in three phases how some of these tools could bring about playful engagement. We conducted the workshop with a Wizard of Oz puppeteering system that included two identical pepper robots. One of them, the puppet on the left, was kinesthetically controlled by one or two dancers, while the other, the puppeteered on the right, was replicating the motions of the puppet through wireless communication of the robot's joint positions. We use this as a way of exploratory prototyping to gather design ideas for the programming of the robot. Based on the insights from this workshop then, we plan to develop algorithms that will allow the robot to take improvisational decisions autonomously. In this slide, you can see an initial high-level diagram of how we envision this happening in future steps. The main lessons that we learned from the workshop were the following. Firstly, that rule-based techniques are useful for providing a framework with enough constraints to guide the interaction, but also enough room for playful exploration. 
Moreover, these improvisation methods help exploring the movement possibilities and the expressivity of a robot without predetermined goal in mind, which leaves therefore more room for creativity and flexibility. Secondly, we realize that rendering both robot and human to the same rules allows them to connect on a level that does not require language-based interaction nor the communication of content or intention, which helped us also explore those aspects of social interaction that allow for engagement beyond communicative content. Thirdly, we noticed the importance of working from the embodiment of the robot and without an imitative approach in mind. And finally, we learned that the limitations of the technology can become assets in this framework and that we needed to make the limitations work to our advantage. To conclude, in our paper, we argue for the relevance of external and imagined perspectives of improvisation as a way of developing playful, open-ended interactions and interactions that do not rely on communicative content, yet can play an important role in bringing about and sustaining HRI. In this framework, movement emerges in response to a stimuli and not as a way of expressing emotional states or communicating intention. Furthermore, these rules offer an algorithmic-like basis for programming robot behavior that allows for movement to emerge in these playful encounters. For now, we assume that random selection of such parameters can create rich enough behavior, but in the future, we would like to investigate more complex decision-making algorithms to guide the improvisational choices, and to do so also in collaboration with improvisation experts. Thank you so much for listening. Hi everyone, my name is Daniela DiPaola and I'm a graduate student in the Personal Robots Group at the MIT Media Lab. I'm excited to be sharing some of the work that I did alongside Anna Cecilia Ostrowski, Riley Spiegel, Kate Darling, and Cynthia Brazil with you today, and it's titled Children's Perspectives of Advertising with Social Robots, a Policy Investigation. So I want to start off by talking about Astro, Amazon's new robot for the home. Astro is different than other smart speakers that Amazon has created because it's designed to be an embodied character. It has eyes and it traverses around one's home. And so with Astro, this kind of begs the question, what does it mean for a consumer company to have a robot that's active in our homes? I think we can go back to some of, um, some of the core techniques that we use in our fields, personalization and persuasion. We know that personalization can lead to trust and rapport and therefore allowing users to accomplish incredible goals. And by the same token, persuasion has also been known to lead to believability, as if a robot was not persuasive, it would not be able to help the user accomplish its goals. And in our fields, we've largely used these techniques to help people accomplish really positive goals, such as learning outcomes, managing one's health, um, but you can imagine that there's new challenges that come up if we start using personalization and persuasion in advertising. And this is especially relevant given that consumer companies who largely rely on advertising for their business model are now starting to use technologies such as social robots. And even further, when we think about advertising in the home, we want to be mindful of children who can be especially vulnerable given that years of research has shown that children under the ages of 12 years do not fully understand the intent of advertising. And so the research question of this project is, what are children's preferences for how social robots should advertise to them? We do this by introducing students to types of legislation around social robots. And part of that legislation can be related to the advertising capabilities of a robot. And so to do this, we give students many different types of laws and they're required to pass or not pass these laws. We focus on lots of different topics in the toolkit at large, but for the sake of this paper, we'll be focusing specifically on advertising. And so I'll share the cards that students were um, required to sort. The first card says that ro robots cannot advertise things to users. The second says that the company can advertise things to the user through the robot, so it has to be explicit. We're talking about transparency here. And then finally, robots can advertise things to the user through casual conversations with the user. In this one, we see this as particularly persuasive because the robot will be using its natural interaction patterns to also 
um, introduce advertisements and persuade students to buy things. If you look at these all at large, we have cards that range from more regulation to less regulation and less persuasiveness to more persuasiveness. So students were given these cards and asked to sort them into buckets that they thought um, were appropriate based on their own experiences and beliefs. And these children were um, from ages nine to 11 years old. And like I mentioned earlier, children under the age of 12, 12 is kind of this cutoff that we think about when we think about advertising and students' ability to understand the role of advertising. All the students that we interviewed had um, lived with the Jiba robot for two months prior to the study. They had these lived experiences with this robot in their home, and they were able to bring them directly to the toolkit session. And all the sessions were done in a 45 minute one-on-one -on -one Zoom session. So we found overall that students preferred the less regulation and more persuasive card to pass into legislation. So if you remember, this card is that robots can advertise things to the user through casual conversations with the user. So this is interesting because there seems to be a tension between what is safe for a student and what they actually might prefer. And so to dive deeper into why this tension is there, we looked at the qualitative results as to why students organized the cards the way they did, the way that they did. We found six qualitative themes. Um, if you'd like to dive deeper into some of these themes, um, I encourage you to look at the paper, which is rich with lots of quotes about the students' responses. But for the sake of the presentation, I'm going to dive deeper into the two most popular themes that we found, users' experience and technology and its enactment. So the most common factor that children focused their reasoning on was the user's experience. And this included the user's awareness, their preference, the annoyance they might have with the experience, um, and the ease and helpfulness of the robot interaction. And so in this case, you can see that the child is really wanting the robot to advertise through casual conversation because it feels very natural. It's tailored towards the user. The other common factor that students shared was the robot's embodiment and how the interaction was really designed. In this case, we see that the student really preferred casual conversations because it seemed like a more natural way of interaction, similar to the other ways that they'd interacted with the robot earlier. And so by looking at these results, it's important that we think about how we might strike the balance between um, what might be safest for students and what they might um, prefer as, in terms of their experiences. And so further exploration of these themes that I shared earlier um, may be the way to go with future research. So in conclusion, I wanna share some of the high level points that we're making in this paper. First, social robots may po pose new challenges for advertising due to their techniques of persuasion and personalization. Secondly, children with social robot experience advocated for advertising policies that support less regulation and more persuasiveness. This is a tension between what is preferred by the child and what might be safest for them. And so the themes that we found in this research may be important for future exploration of this topic. Thank you so much. My, again, my name is Daniela and I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A session or over email. Hi everyone, I'm Sadib Bedeidi, a PhD candidate at the Colorado School of Mines. I'll be presenting work done with Taryn Mott and Tom Williams at the Mirror Lab, titled Practical, Ethical, and Overlooked, Teleoperated Socially Assistive Robots in the Quest for Autonomy. Socially assistive robots come in various morphologies, but all of them share this in common. These robots provide assistance through social interaction. Research in socially assistive robots seems to default to autonomy, either by perceiving the ideal socially assistive robot system as requiring no expert operator or extensive training, or by perceiving teleoperation as not sustainable or intractable in critical socially assistive domains. Now within the HRI community, there are researchers who focus their work on how to select a robot's level of autonomy. Specifically, we look at the work from Beer and others, where they discuss how autonomy is not a binary decision and that it contains many levels of autonomy, or LOA. 
They also provide guidelines for selecting the appropriate LOA. With that in mind, we look to determine whether there is a mismatch between levels of autonomy chosen in the literature and those recommended by level of autonomy selection guidelines. Since the domain of the robot is necessary to determine the appropriate LOA, we start by asking what socially assistive robot domains are most prevalent in recent research. For those domains, what range of LOAs would be recommended? And for comparison, what LOAs are researchers currently applying to socially assistive robots and envisioning for the future? We analyzed the last five years of papers at HRI and THRI that mention socially assistive robots. We coded each paper for the domain in which the robot was used, the level of autonomy of the robot and why that was chosen, and the future level of autonomy motivating the work. In terms of the domains in which socially assistive robots are researched, we identified 16 domains. Since we want to understand what level of autonomy is appropriate, we look at the three most prevalent domains in the research, and those are assisting elderly individuals, assisting in education, and assisting in therapy. To select an appropriate LOA, selection guidelines suggest we begin by evaluating domains on three dimensions, task criticality, task accountability, and environment complexity. If the task is highly critical or requires high levels of accountability, then low levels of autonomy should be used. When environments are complex, a high level of autonomy is required and human supervision is suggested. When assisting the elderly, robots provide companionship or assist vulnerable individuals who exhibit cognitive impairments. Task criticality and accountability vary from low for companionship to high when supporting vulnerable individuals. Environment complexity is fairly low, as these robots are often used in the home or an elder care facility. When assisting in education, socially assistive robots are often tutors, helping young children in a classroom or at home. Task criticality depends on the topic that robots are assisting with. Accountability is crucial when working with children, as parents may want insight into what their children are learning. Environment complexity can range from low in a static environment at home to high in a loud and dynamic classroom. When assisting in therapy, socially assistive robots are supporting vulnerable individuals. That means that task criticality and accountability are high. Therapy may occur in an office environment with low complexity or at a gym, which may involve a higher degree of complexity. We find that for assisting the elderly and in education, we would expect a wide range of LOAs with some teleoperation. For therapy, we would expect low LOAs with a substantial amount of teleoperation. In summary, level of autonomy selection guidelines suggest that socially assistive robots use low levels of autonomy with few exceptions. Let's compare that to what researchers are currently choosing and envisioning for socially assistive robots. We found that a plurality of the papers involved autonomous robots. Importantly, most papers did not include a rationale for their LOA choice. Additionally, most papers did not explicitly include a future level of autonomy motivating their work or were ambivalent about future autonomy. When papers presented a future level of autonomy, most papers described a future with autonomous robots. We also found interesting trends in socially assistive robot deployment. Fully autonomous robots mostly work with the assisted individual directly. When teleoperated, however, there are two variations. Either the robot is being teleoperated by a caregiver, or the robot is teleoperated by the assisted individual themselves. This distinction is really important because it means that the user changes. When using a fully autonomous robot, the user is the assisted individual. When the robot is teleoperated by a caregiver, the robot user may still be the assisted individual, but now there's also a teleoperation interface that has the caregiver as the user. When teleoperated by the assisted individual, the robot user may be other individuals that the robot interacts with on behalf of the assisted individual, who is now the teleoperation user. Evaluating teleoperated robots requires a different perspective. Additionally, each of these approaches presents limitations. When building fully autonomous robots, researchers often have to limit the scope of the robot in order to deliver effective assistance. When teleoperated by a caregiver, there is now a need for a teleoperation interface and the caregiver to operate the robot. Similarly, when operated by the assisted individual, there's a need for a teleoperation interface. 
Overall, socially assistive robot researchers are clearly interested in autonomous robots, but rarely present the rationale for that choice. Autonomy is not always the right answer, and in fact, LOA selection guidelines suggest that lower levels of autonomy or more teleoperation are often recommended. Importantly, the choice in LOA changes the design objectives and the target user and can introduce limitations. That decision should be taken with careful consideration. Based on these findings, we recommend that researchers explicitly specify their choice in level of autonomy and provide a rationale for that choice. These choices can change the research problem since they introduce additional important factors. And finally, teleoperation is often a practical long-term choice that researchers should consider more closely. Thank you all for listening. I look forward to answering your questions. Hello everyone, I'm Maria Lucia Lupetti from TU Delft, and I'm presenting this work also on behalf of Martin van Mechelen from Aarhus University. Our work is about robot deception, and specifically the fact that appearance and or the way a robot is programmed to behave creates the illusion of sentience, emotional capabilities, ability to care or understand humans. Robot deception is seen generally as a beneficial or even necessary strategy to achieve positive and successful HRI, yet some also argue that deception can lead people to overestimate robots' ability to understand the world and situations, and consequently delegate decisions and actions that would significantly impact the quality of human life. So we think that to deal with these concerns, we should promote critical thinking. In particular, we should nurture critical mindsets. Critical thinking, in fact, is a learning process where one has to engage and evaluate with pros and cons of a given topic as a way to establish a truth, to transform information and generate new ideas. This is not a novel topic in education, but is relatively underexplored in educational robotics. And this is where our work focuses on. We specifically engage with the question of how can a social robot foster critical thinking and how can it make children reflect on what robots can do and how they relate to us. We engaged a class of 20 children from a primary school in an activity that was explicitly inspired by the philosophy for children approach by Matthew Lipman. This uh, approach started in the 70s and grown in popularity over the years and is specifically aimed at improving children's reasoning abilities and judgment. In this approach, children are invited to read a novel that includes ambiguities and paradoxes and then to formulate questions and hold a dialogue in what they call a community of inquiry. So we thought, what if we use robots as a springboard for debate? in the same way as Lipman was using the novels. And this is why we look for ways to create ambiguities and form of deception in the experience. We use this small low anthropomorphic robot called Shaibo, which can give the impression of being scared by reacting to loud sounds. And then it can give the impression of intentionality by moving at irregular time intervals with a minimum interval of 15 minutes. So really when children do not expect that, and then we use the robot ability to recognize color, to associate them with soundtracks that would give the impression to children that the robot has memories. And then we engage children in an activity focused on analyzing and discussing the robot. This activity was composed by several steps that were facilitated by what we call the robot analysis form. We video recorded the whole experience and then performed exploratory sequential data analysis and discourse analysis on the video transcripts. We look for interest and motivation and indicators of a community of inquiry, which is a form of debate that shows disagreement, argumentation, negotiation, and shared understanding. We plotted the behaviors we observed and we noticed how children were very engaged and motivated, were constantly raising their hands, but at the same time we were concerned 
that despite their motivation and uh, engagement, we were not really generating a proper community of inquiry because the possibility of speaking was always regulated and given by the teacher. And we summarized this as the talking norm. So the act of raising the hand, being named by the teacher, and then speaking. So there was no free flow of opinions and ideas. Yet, we could also notice some breakings in the talking norm. Specifically, when the robot was showing some unexpected behaviors, children started to stand up, talking, discussing in a very unregulated way and in a also noisy way. But we considered this a very positive indicator that the experience could really foster a free exchange and expression of ideas. And it was really interesting to see that this was emerging, especially when the robot was showing the deceptive behaviors. Furthermore, when we analyzed the discussion transcript, we could also notice how children were expressing disagreement and also building on each other ideas. So we actually noticed the qualities of discussion we were looking for, so divergent thinking and shared understanding. To conclude, this experience shows how a robot can foster critical thinking and more specifically promote reflections on what technologies like robots are and what they can do and how they relate to us. And more broadly, we engage with the idea of benevolent deception and illustrated how the deceptive potential of a robot could be exactly the aspect that would make robots uniquely or at least distinctively suited for promoting children's critical thinking at school. So we would like to really close our presentation with a provocation for HRI designers, which is to embrace and magnify robot aspects with a deceptive potential, such as personality and intentionality, so that they become explicitly controversial and may be used as a springboard for a critical debate. So thank you all for listening. And please remember, this is just a teaser. Go through the paper. There is much more. Hello, everyone. Today, me and my colleague Leticia will present to you the paper Gender Fairness and Social Robotics, Exploring a Future Care of Paripartum Depression. We are a multidisciplinary team of researchers from two Swedish universities. From Lund University, we have Leticia Tankre and Stefan Larsson. And from Uppsala University, we have Ginevra Castellano, Meng Yusung, and myself, Tobias Paulson. Now Leticia is going to present to you the aim of our paper. So, the aim for this paper was to bridge sociology of law and HRI in order to understand how socially assisted robots could screen for peripartum depression. So we conceptualize gender fairness within this interdisciplinary setting, whereby gender fairness is a principle according to which socially assisted robots are designed following a gender sensitive approach. And so for this, we needed to inform the design on what that meant. But first, what is peripartum depression? So it's a depression that can occur any time from conception up to one to two years after the pregnancy. It is said to affect 20% of women. However, 69% of the cases are said to actually go undetected. So for this paper, we decided what if a socially assisted robot could help with the screening stage since peripartum depression must be diagnosed and thus screened. So we wanted to do so accounting for gender and governance aspects when developing this robot. So for our research questions, we wanted to explore gender norms in the PPD context and how social assisted robots could challenge the current medical practices. We also investigate how gender fairness could be integrated into the design of social robots for PPD screening and what relevant governance aspects should be taken into the consideration to ensure gender fairness for social assisted robots. Our approach was to conduct interviews with domain experts. These were PPD experts and gender study experts. We conducted interview with eight participants through online video calls. The interview procedure were divided into three parts, where we first asked questions about gender norms in current practices. Then we presented a text vignette with a fictional but realistic scenario to set the scene. And then we showed a video demonstration where the robot would interact with a fictional patient 
After that, we asked questions on how to challenge gender norms in robot design for PPD screening. And lastly, we asked questions relating to governance aspects, such as what data should a robot have access to. Here you can see a snippet of the video that we showed to our participants, where one of our researchers were acting as a patient. The robot we used is the second generation fur hat with the latest SDK that includes the face core functionality. This allowed us to craft a rapid prototype with human-like features. Now Letitia is going to present to you the results. So, turning to the results. After we qualitatively coded the results, we found four different uh, themes. So the first one was around negative gender norms within peripartum depression. Here, all the experts agreed that it mostly emanated from the medical institution, as well as societal expectations, although women did have some role that they played into this. A second theme we found was around challenging peripartum depression processes with socially assisted robots. But we found very much polar opposite views on this. So turning to peripartum depression experts first, they viewed the robot as an ally, as something that could actually review the current processes and question it, but also deviate from the usual procedure, such as having more time with the patient. But also the socially assistive robot could very much be integrated within the workflow. Whereas in contrast, the gender studies were much more critical of this robot. They were very much of the opinion, what are, what are we reproducing here? Especially since depression belongs solely to the medical institution. And so maybe the socially assistive robot would simply add a bureaucratic layer and wouldn't be so helpful. So maybe if we want women to talk more about how they're feeling, then this could be done outside of the medical institution with such a robot. Then our third uh, surrounded the HRI design and how we could inform it. So turning to the robot behavior, PPD experts focus much more on the verbal aspects, such as the robot agreeing or repeating the patient, whereas gender experts were very much on the nonverbal aspects, so such as mirroring or showing empathy through body language. However, turning to robots' appearance, all of a sudden, it wasn't so much about expertise, but more about the experience. And they found that it was important to personalize socially assisted robot in such a way for the patient to feel more at ease. But also this may be that the robot should look somewhat human, but in a synthetic way. And then finally, with regards to uh, robot governance and gender fairness, when asking our participants if the robot should have access to data about the patient beforehand, PPD experts had very mixed views overall. Um, for them, maybe an other form would be to ask for medical backgrounds, um, but also train the actor, train the robot on access so that the robot could learn about the nuances of talking about such a sensitive topic. Gender study experts, on the other hand, were adamant that the medical records were quite biased to the medical professional themselves. So maybe instead the socially assisted robot could ask questions directly to the patient. But what should really be reflected upon is the design stage on the values, what values are important. So turning to the discussion. So there were clearly a lot of HRI design implications such as questioning the context as well as the robot itself. For the future of governance, it is clear that we need to keep a user-centric approach at all times and that includes stakeholders. And finally, we have shown, we hope, that HRI should indeed bridge with other disciplines to find synergies, but also critical ones. So in conclusion, will socially assisted robots help screen for peripartum depression in five years time? Maybe, if gender norms are accounted for, and it is an intersectional sensitive approach and that we reflect on power structures all the time. Thank you so much for listening.